almost fifteen years ago, about the same time of the year, when the monsoons were at their peak. Monsoons that particular year was of such intensity and we were sitting in the same place. The building looks more stable. <clears throat> Things happened in that little hut which was precariously holding itself up, threatening to collapse any time. Too many things happened. I said too many things. Too many things are always happening. Too many things have always happening. Too many things have always been happening in the world and in the jungle, on the plains and on the mountains. Too many things have always been happening. So this whole phenomena of life of such variety and such exuberance, if you have a little closer look at the smaller creatures on this planet, You cannot believe what has gone into making those tiny little creatures of every shape, size, color, design. <clears throat> Unbelievable volume of detail almost unending variety of detail. This whole process of life – the life that you can see and the life that you cannot see, too much is happening. It is all happening with such procession that it looks like it's all happening by itself. The exactness with which all dimensions of cosmos are performing right now. the animate and the inanimate. It looks like they're all by themselves. <coughs> Once a month, uh, I get an order from the publication department. 
Signed, Alexander. I'm sorry, Alexandra. So I can't ignore. Sadhguru, it's time to write a poem. We need a poem for forest flower. We need it in the next twelve hours, fifteen hours, twenty-four hours, usually that's how it comes. So, I haven't failed them but I have been on, not on time many times. So, <clears throat> this is known as the Cosmic Dancer, the title is Cosmic Dancer. There is no dance without a dancer. There is no dance without a dancer. The dancer is not felt in a dance perfect. The dancer is not felt in a dance perfect. The perfection of the dance dissolves the dancer into the dance. The perfection of the dance dissolves the dancer into the dance. Reveling in the dance, one may miss the dancer. Reveling in the dance, one may miss the dancer. Absolute attention to the dance will bring forth the effulgent dancer. Absolute attention to the dance will bring forth the effulgent dancer. Only in knowing the dancer, all the dance is revealed. Only in knowing the dancer, all the dance is revealed. The speed, the rhythm and the flight are just the dancer's light. The speed, the rhythm and the flight are just the dancer's flight, slight. So, the dance is so perfect, we almost forget the dancer. But there can be no dance without a dancer. We cannot see the dancer because our vision, our attention becomes so surface oriented. To identify the dancer in the dance, Either you must get immersed in the dance, that you also become the dance, that you are not a spectator, you are it. Then you know the dancer by experience, you are touched by it. But if you not want to know the dancer, in its full depth, in his full depth and dimension. You want to know the source of dance, that which is the basis of the act. Then you must be able to pay absolute attention. In a way, staying away from the dance, these things look contradictory. On one level I am saying you must plunge into the dance, another level I am saying you must be able to watch the dance with utmost intensity. This is not contradictory because you know the world is round, nothing contradicts anything. It is just that when you look at it, fragment it, if you cut it down into pieces and look at it, everything seems to be contradictory. <clears throat> so, if you are here, totally involved in the dance, totally involved in the act itself. That's one way of knowing. Or if you know how to keep away from the act, absolutely uninvolved in the act, but you're able to observe the act totally, you can decipher 
the difference between the act and the actor, the dance and the dancer, that is also a way of knowing it. The second takes much more awareness, sharpness, intensity, maybe training too. So it's easier to become part of the dance slowly as the rhythm picks up, as you get sucked into it. You suck deeper and deeper into it, one, one day you don't know which is you and which is the dance. Once you are a part of the dance, you cannot miss the presence of the dancer. It is just that <coughs> we are inventing obstructions, hurdles and barriers where they don't exist. Recently, when I was in a satsang in Ceylon, someone asked, I'm fifty-four years of age, he thinks that's a long time. And I have seen so many spiritual teachers, but I have never been drawn to anybody like you. I'm helplessly being drawn towards you. What is it that you got? <clears throat> so I said, I don't have anything that you don't have. It is just that all of us were given a seed that had the possibility of boundlessness. You are a very careful man. You are very careful and good, so you preserve the seed. I destroyed the seed and made it into a tree. If you want to make a seed into a tree, the seed has to go. If you nurture the seed, it will become a tree. If you keep seed as a seed and walk around, it's stupid actually. But it is not. Preserving yourself is considered smart. Allowing yourself to be demolished, to destroy the limited possibility of what an individual person is, is not considered smart. To be exclusive and to be preserved is considered smart. So after all, you are a smart man. So sma smart, you even conned life. Too smart. On a certain day, Shankaran Pillai himself decided to visit the yoga center. Being who he is, he was received properly and our Swami Vibhu <laughs> took him on a tour and put him up in the first floor of the Chitra block because it has the best view. You know that? Chitra block first floor has the best view in the whole of the ashram. So, Swami pointed at the mountains and said, we're putting you up you here because of who you are and because this place has the best view. Shankaran Pillai looked at it and said, yes, sure, this place would have had the best view if only the mountains were not obstructing.
these people are doing to themselves. <laughs> you don't understand mountain is the view. You think mountain is in the way. So the spiritual process is not just about doing this or that. It is many things. So once you become like this, there is no possibility of you being part of any act. You can neither be aware and just watch it, because that takes a different kind of dispassion, nor can you jump into it and become a part of it. Once it happened, <clears throat> Abe Maxwell met a painter. whose name was Volkowitz and Volkowitz was seventy-three years of age and just recently had been through an eye surgery. So he said, you just been through an eye surgery, how is your vision? Is it good enough to paint? Can you continue to be a painter? Without sharp vision, this is difficult. So Volkowitz said, I think I can paint. In case I find my vision fails and I cannot paint, I will become a critic. <laughs> you can become an art critic if you can't see anything. So if you become a critic, you miss the whole act. Either you be a painter or you be a lover of art. If you are a critic, you miss the whole point. You'll know that… you'll know neither this nor that. But this keeps happening all the time. <laughs> Self-appointed critics simply waste their lives. I forget his name, one great literary critic said this, I have seen statues and portraits of authors, poets, artists, but never of a critic. Because <laughs> you're… you're a parasite like life. You have, don't have a life of your own. You thrive constantly looking and feeding on somebody else's life. This will not get you anywhere. If you are seeking survival, you can be a parasite. If you are seeking liberation, you cannot be a parasite. A child sucks upon her mother's breast, but you don't call a babe a parasite. That is okay, because a child is only nourishing himself to become free of the mother. A parasite is never intending to become free. A parasite is too concerned about its survival that it misses the possibility so if survival is all we seek, there are many ways to survive. I won't teach you those ways, you should learn it on the street. 
If liberation is what you seek, only then I am meaningful to you. Only then it's worth hanging around. Only then it's worth being part of a mad act like this. If survival is what you're seeking, it's just a wrong place because it doesn't work that way. Now, all of us have come with the same seed, but for this seed to become a tree, though every seed has come with the same possibility, between a seed and a tree, there is a journey to be made. If you want the seed to become a tree, you have to nurture it. You have to protect it. There are weeds that you have to take care of. There are too many weeds. Same silly weeds bothering humanity for a million years. Still human beings haven't figured out how to handle these weeds. Simple things like anger, hatred, jealousy, fear, doubt, endless doubt. The same silly weeds have lasted too long because weeds don't need any nurturing. Weeds don't need any protection. Weeds don't need any cultivation, they just grow. But if you want a sacred seed to sprout and prosper, you have to weed the place, cultivate the land, manure it and you have to make sure enough water and sunlight finds its way. If you're afraid of the harshness of the sunlight and avoid it, you will also avoid the life-nourishing warmth of the sunlight. In your enslavement to the instinct of self-preservation, you would like to avoid the sunlight, go stand in a shade, but you will miss the warmth of the life-nourishing light too. That which is the basis of life, is also that which ends life. That which burns also bakes. If you are a good cook, you bake. If you are a bad one, you burn. It's a very simple but subtle operation. Baking bread, very simple thing, but a subtle operation. One who knows does it effortlessly, one who doesn't burns it up and makes it into cakes or he produces coal. Carbon is very good, you know, it's the basis of life on this planet. So making this work it's very simple if you give in to the whole process. It's very hard if you resist and struggle with the simple process that is set forth. I have been talking about this in the past. When people come here, some people come as investigators. Slowly, they become students. Gradually, they become disciples. All this is fine, but if you want to be absorbed and you want to travel fast, you must become a devotee, otherwise it won't work takes a long time. 
and nobody can make you a devotee. There is no teaching. There is teaching as to how to make you into a good disciple. There is teaching as to how to make you into a good student. And of course there is training as to how to make you into a good investigator. But there is no teaching or training as to how to make you into a good devotee. Stand like this, say this, say that, that will not make you into a devotee. By doing this act or that act, by uttering these words or those words, you will not become a devotee. If you allow yourself to become a process, if you allow yourself to become part of the dance, then somewhere when the source of the dance touches you, then you naturally become one. There is no other way to be. Yesterday someone was telling me, <clears throat> there have been moments when in the presence of the Dhyana Linga, I saw the whole universe, but with you I have seen nothing. That's good. Mm -hmm. Isn't it good enough that you have seen it with Dhyana Linga? At least somewhere you saw something, is that not good enough? No, no, there's something here. <laughs> I carried Dhyana Linga within myself like a pregnant woman for three lifetimes. To be pregnant for three lifetimes is tough, you know, yes. <laughs> Those of you who have done it for nine months, you know it's tough. By ninth month you're just waiting, when is he going to be out? Being pregnant for three lifetimes is such a big one <laughs> Not easy. So, don't, uh, don't waste your time. By constantly going through the same nonsense that human beings have gone through for a million years, the same nonsense. It's time to do some new nonsense at least, something new. <laughs> Same nonsense. This moment it is true, next moment it is not true, this moment it is great, next moment it is not great. I thought you're wonderful but you're terrible. This moment, oh, this is it, next moment doubt. Don't do this to yourself because at least if it was some unique nonsense you were doing, it's fine. This is the same stupid nonsense people have done forever. Do something new and show me. Show me some new weeds at least. <laughs> if you don't show me a fabulous crop, at least show me some new weeds. There are no new weeds, people have done it all. It's a very simple process. This damn weed growing business is a very simple process. Any fool can do it. You think you're doing it more intelligently than somebody else. There is no such thing. No, no, my doubt is not like that. My doubt is <laughs> the same nonsense. <laughs> Don't think it's more intelligent. Now, uh, I don't know anything about all this. 
I do not know what is making all this happen. All I know is, this much has worked for me. My back pain went away. All right, let's start from that. Something as mundane as back pain. And when you had the back pain, it was not a simple thing. Now that it's gone, it's a simple thing. When you had it, it was not a simple thing. It ruled your life, the back pain. Now that it is gone, why argue and waste your time? <clears throat> if you… if you want to learn how to swim, you lie down in your bed and practice every day. Slowly, slowly, slowly you learn swimming. You'll never learn swimming. <laughs> you have to jump into the water and somehow thrash it out. What if I drown? Don't you see nobody has drowned till now, isn't that good enough proof? Don't you see the pools of water that we create, people can't drown, even if you go in it pushes you out? And don't you see that that I'm not going to let anybody drown here and get into trouble. At least you trust that, <laughs> if not anything else. <clears throat> there is no other way to swim. You have to jump into the water. No, can I hold on to a float? Can I do this? Okay, do that, take your time. But without getting into the water, how? It cannot work. So, every day, every day, every day, when we say sadhana, 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 sadhana is not just about the practice. To give you a simple sadhana, a twenty-one minute practice maybe right now, for the earlier ones maybe thirty-five minute practice. To give you a twenty-one minute practice, we are spending almost forty to forty-five hours with you. To give that old thirty-five minute practice or actually it was fifteen minute shunya, to give you that fifteen minute shunya we spent over sixty hours with you. If all that was not important, why would we spend that time with you? So when we say sadhana, it includes all that. I gave you those three eyes. Hmm? You forgotten? Not this instruction, integrity and intensity of purpose. If you just maintain this, the whole process is towards taking you towards an all-inclusive state because… not because that is my idea, not because that is my desire for you, because that is the nature of the Creator and the seed of the Creator is within and it will not rest. It will not give you a moment of rest in your life till it finds its original nature. Don't you have any uh, hopes about knowing what peace is, knowing what bliss is without allowing him to have his way? Don't you have any such stupid hope? 
you will never know a moment of rest in your life. You will never know a moment of peace in your life. You will never know a moment of absolute ease in your life till you allow him to find his way. Otherwise he will not let you rest, never. Sadhguru, a pupil asked, Is it best for me, Master, to walk the straight path or would it be better for me to choose the crooked path on which my spirit leads me? The Master replied, He who takes the straight path north sees the north. He who takes the straight path south sees the south. He who takes the straight path east sees the east. He who takes the straight path west sees the west. And he who walks the crooked path sees all the directions. Please comment. So, in praise of the crooked, There was a crooked man. You need to understand, this… who said this? Do you know who said that? No? No, not the question, who was the master who said that? No? Okay. Okay, probably, most probably from the Zen tradition. <clears throat> this is being said because people were getting identified identified with different dogmas. When they said a straight path, they were talking about a dogmatic path, following scriptures and teachings in a certain way. So if you're facing north, it goes only north, if you go west, it goes only west, east goes only east, south goes only south. But if you take a crooked path, you will see all, but you will not get anywhere. <laughs> you take a crooked path, you make a whole round, you have a good sightseeing tour, but you're back in the same place. So, are you here to do sightseeing or are you here to get somewhere? That's a question. I'm not trying to discredit what's been said because that's definitely been said with reference to dogmatic ways of doing things. But I want you to look at it because if you are thinking a crooked path means that you can afford to be crooked, there is no such path. <laughs> you can take a bend in the path but you got to be straight. If you are thinking somebody is approving your crookedness, <laughs> if you are crooked, there is no path, there is no such thing. If you are straight, everything is a path. There is no such thing as straight path, there is no such thing as crooked path because the path is inward. Where is it straight? Where is it inward? If you go north, I would say you are wrong. If you go south, you are definitely wrong. If you go east, you are wrong. If you go west, you are wrong. If you go up, you are wrong. If you go down, you are wrong. Spiritual process will happen to you, not because you look up, not because you do look down, not because you look in the four different directions, but because you look inward. 
inward is neither north nor south nor east nor west nor up nor down because what is inward is dimensionless. That which is dimensionless can neither be approached by a straight path or a crooked path but only by somebody who is straight within himself. Being straight within himself simply means at least you're straight with yourself. You've gotten used to bullshitting others. It's up to you. If you do it, slowly situations will push you to your corner. In the larger societies, you can bullshit a little more. There's little more opportunity to get away with it. In a small society like this, if you bullshit two people, that day everybody knows you are a heap and they know where to put you. <laughs> because here, gossip is an effective means of communication. Everybody knows this person did a little bit of nonsense here and there and there, everybody knows. In the larger society you could bullshit them a little while longer, but there also if you bullshit too much they'll push you to the corner. Maybe that's how you got here. <laughs> so, if you want to go anywhere, the first and foremost thing is that you are straight. Then don't worry about the path, whether it's straight or crooked, up or down. Those are all created just to make you feel little adventurous. Actually, there is no path. You stepped out, you projected your whole life out, which is very illusory. If you stop the projection, everything is inside. Even now everything is inside. Please tell me, where do you see me? Not here. I am entering through the windows of your eyes and you are seeing me within, within you. I am within you right now, you hear me within you. The whole world is within you, everything that ever happened to you is within you. So, the outward projection is an illusion. It is like, if you turn on the projector, the cinema is on the screen. It's all real. If you get involved with it, it's all real. In the cinema, people have fallen in love much more with the people that they saw two-dimensional on the cinema screen than the three-dimensional people who are around them. Isn't it so? Isn't it so? More people on this planet have fallen in love with the two-dimensional play of light and sound than the three-dimensional play of flesh and blood. Isn't that so? Because they turn off the lights, that's the main thing. You do one thing, go and watch the greatest cinema with all the lights on. Your hero and heroine will not look attractive, the lights are all off. Naturally your focus, <laughs> they became so beautiful, they became so attractive simply because all other things were cut off just by switching off the lights in the cinema hall. In a way, that's what meditation means. You close your eyes and if you simply sit here, Initially, for a while, the outside insanity plays itself out. If you simply sit in the right kind of presence, then after your outside nonsense has played itself out, 
there is no other distraction, you just look at this one, this is an explosive form of life. This is not a simple life. Now you saw the cinema in two-dimensional figures and those people that you saw in the cinema, you fall in love with them much more. Somebody told you, love thy neighbor. If he had only ta told you, love your cinema star, it would instantly his teaching would have worked. <laughs> neighbor. There are two. <laughs> There's so much room for distraction. If all distractions are taken away and you just look at anything, you'll fall in love with that, anything. You look at an insect, you look at a flower, you look at a twig, you look at the mountain, you look at the rock, you look at a grain of sand without any distraction, you will absolutely fall in love with that. That's what meditation means. So, you don't go on a straight path, nor do you go on a crooked one. You stop doing this foolishness of doing straights and crookeds and bends. You learn to be straight with yourself and don't try to go anywhere, just be simply here, it will happen because there is nowhere to go. There is no way for anybody to experience anything outside of themselves, please see. There is no way for you right now to experience anything outside of yourself. Anything that happens to you happens only within you, never outside. So what path are you talking about? Path is always about going somewhere. When you have no need to go anywhere, then you're on the path. It's neither straight nor crooked. It is neither long nor short. It is definitely north nor south. It is inward. Inward is not a direction. Inward is a dimension. It is just that the problem with the spiritual path, the problem with lots of you being here is just this. On a certain day, an old farmer, a considered to be wise, was carrying a big bundle and approached a tunnel. He was just about to enter the tunnel, then he thought, it's all right, the tunnel is wide enough here, I can enter this, but that little hole that I see there, I'm sure I cannot get out of it. And he backed out. So, this is something that your mind cannot understand because when you say a path, it's about going somewhere. Nobody understood a path as not going somewhere. Always the word path simply meant to go somewhere. There's a very common joke played in the rural areas of Karnataka. If somebody comes to the village and it is normal to ask, that means where does this road go? That's how the language is. So the smart answer is, that means this road will lie here itself, it doesn't go anywhere. The road never goes anywhere, it's you who has to go. So, when we utter the word path, naturally your mind thinks there is somewhere to go, there is nowhere to go. When I say nowhere to go, 
that does not mean stagnation. I'm talking about really know where to go. I'm not talking about some where to go. Some is only this much or that much. No is limitless, isn't it? Something means a certain quantity. Nothing is not a quantity. It is another dimension which is measureless. It is another possibility which is beginningless and endless. So we are talking about nowhere to go, really nowhere to go, not somewhere. Somewhere is too small a place, it's not worth going. Nowhere is a limitless space. So if you go north, you will go somewhere. If you go south, you go somewhere. If you go east or west, you will go somewhere. If you go around, you only go somewhere. That's not our intention. We want to go nowhere. Is that okay? Because the journey is from the limited to the unlimited. The only unlimited is the nothingness. The nowhere is the only unlimited space. So, are we just talking with some, just enjoying the circus of using logic in all kinds of funny ways? You ask the question because still your mind is in such a state that every day thinks up a new way of avoiding it. It's innovative. You're all very innovative, aren't you? Every day you come up with a new reason why it cannot be done. I have convinced you a hundred times over, it is possible. At that moment you said, yes. Tomorrow you came up with a new innovation as to why it is not possible. So still the mind is in that state. So you like this logical mind which seems to come up with lot of innovations to keep you in its own ambit, to keep you within its limitations. So let us look at it from its perspective from the perspective of the logical mind. Now we understand, the logical mind also understands, the intellect understands that we exist within certain limitations. You are existing within certain limitations. And you also know you have to go beyond these limitations. Many times you have crossed some limitations and immediately you found the next range of limitations. You cross these mountains, the next range is ready. You cross that, the next one is ready. Those of you who have actively crossed, you have seen again and again there seems to be new mountains. Some of you like the same old mountains. You up and down the same thing. That's different. So the logical intellect, if you apply it with sufficient intensity, it clearly realizes that it is not the vehicle to take you beyond. So, if you do not know how to transcend the intellect, at least frustrate the intellect, Yes. You do not know how to transcend it, at least let it get frustrated, beaten. Then it lies low. When it lies low, we can do things with you. 
if <clears throat> if you really want to step inward, it is not that you have to kill the outward because the outward is an illusion. There is enough scientific proof today to tell you the outward is an illusion because everything is happening within you. If you see that everything is inward, there is nothing outward, then naturally you will close your eyes. Even if you have not been initiated into anything, if you just remain with your eyes closed for long enough, you will see, after some time, the activity of the mind will start dying down. Initially it gets hyped up because it wants you to open your eyes, because mind cannot survive without some extra information. Every day it needs some little extra new gossip, otherwise it cannot thrive. So, if you simply remain with eyes closed for long enough, you will see the intellect will just lie low. It will be like your pet dog. Be there, we don't want to kill him. We need him. But we need him when we need him. When we don't want him, we want him to just shut up and sit there. We don't want him to be all the time yelping and barking endlessly. We want him to shut up and sit. When we need him, we want to let him go. Otherwise, we want him to lie low and he will lie low. Once your intellect lies low, if you give it enough time, then the true intelligence begins to function. What you call as a intelligence? And what you call as the source of creation are not different once that begins to function. You are naturally a blissful being, there is no other way to be. Once you are touched by the source of creation, once you stop playing your own games, from the petty information, from the gossip that you have gathered, what you call as information is just gossip. Some people, if you li don't like the people who are gathering information, you call them gossipers, otherwise you call them social scientists. Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so, this gossip that you have gathered, your intellect is thriving on it. If you keep your gossip aside and if true intelligence begins to function, then you and the creator are not different. Once this is so, being blissful is very normal. It is not something that you aspire for. It is not something that you long for. It is not something that you create. That is the way it is. Only when you are blissful by your own nature, then you are willing to drop into the abyss of nothingness. Then you are truly ready to go nowhere. When you are not blissful by your own nature, it is very natural for you to hanker, to go somewhere. You want to go north, south, east or crooked. Whichever way, you are still longing to go somewhere, you are not willing to drop into the abyss of nothingness. When you say, I am seeking the boundless, you are talking about falling into nothingness. It is not a threat. Oh, is it a bottomless pit? Yes, it is. And a bottomless pit is not dangerous. Only a pit with a bottom is dangerous. If there is no bottom to the pit, what is the problem in jumping? 
you will be eternally suspended, unharmed, untouched by anything. If there is such a space which is bottomless and if you fall into it, is there any danger? Is there any danger at all to you? Only if it has a ba bottom, you will go and get smashed. It is truly a bottomless pit. Bliss is a bottomless pit. Only when you fall into the bottomless pit are you truly blissful. Otherwise, you are constantly hankering, wanting to get somewhere, wanting to get somewhere. You cannot go anywhere, wherever you go, whether you go north or south, still your experience of life, all of life is happening only within you. You go up or down, all your life is happening only within you. This is not a trap, this is the door.